Now, how does changing temperature affect equilibrium? When temperature is changed, equilibrium reactions shift in whichever direction helps to restore balance, of course. So how do we predict which direction that is? The answer depends on whether a reaction is exothermic or endothermic. Remember, exothermics have negative delta H's, and endothermics have positive delta H's. If a reaction is exothermic, that is, it has a negative delta H, then the reaction gives off heat. In that case, we can treat heat just like a product, like this. Then we can predict the shift just like we would if we were asked a question that involves changing concentrations. For an endothermic reaction, one that has a positive delta H, the reaction consumes heat. Hence, for an endothermic reaction, we treat heat like a reactant by writing heat on the left side of the equation. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's return to this example, the equilibrium setting between NO4 and NO2 we were looking at earlier. In which direction will the equilibrium shift when the temperature is decreased and when the temperature is increased? I'd like you to pause the video here and think about this on your own and see if you can come up with the answer. You can then hit play and listen to the answer that I give you. Here's the answer. You'll notice that in this equilibrium reaction as it is written, the delta H is positive. It's an endothermic reaction. That means I can treat heat as a reactant, so I could write down heat on the left side of the equation. Now I just treat everything the way I would if I were changing concentrations. If temperature is decreased, that means that I'm removing heat from it. Heat is on the left side of this reaction because it's an endothermic reaction. So imagine if I removed heat, leaving a gaping hole on the left side of the reaction. In which direction will the reaction shift? Well, of course, it wants to fill that hole, so it's going to shift to the left. Now, if the temperature is increased, increasing the temperature means I've added heat. Heat is, of course, on the left side of the reaction. So if I add heat, which is an ingredient on the left side of the reaction, it's just like increasing the amount of stuff on the left. In which direction is it going to shift to restore balance? It's, of course, going to shift to the right. This is how changing temperature affects an equilibrium reaction. We'll now discuss how adding a catalyst affects an equilibrium reaction. OK, as you should remember from our last chapter, to which I'll link right here, catalysts speed up reactions by providing an alternative reaction mechanism that has a lower overall activation energy than the uncatalyzed pathway. You can imagine, then, if I'm in an equilibrium scenario between products and reactants, things going back and forth and back and forth, the only thing that a catalyst does is provides an alternative pathway that's lower in energy and easier and therefore faster than the uncatalyzed pathway. So all that happens is that back and forth and back and forth and back and forth happens faster if I add a catalyst. But it doesn't change the relative amounts or disturb equilibrium at all. We now get to our final subject. Why are chemical equilibrium and Le Chatelier's principle so important? In other words, why do we care about this stuff? Well, I'm going to tell you with a very stark example. Nitrogen, or N2, makes up about 78% of the air in our atmosphere. It is chemically inert, which means that it doesn't react with hardly anything. However, reduced forms of nitrogen, such as nitrogen dioxide, NO2, NH3, and HNO3, for example, are absolutely necessary for all life on Earth, including plant life. Thus, plants have to be fertilized with these useful forms of nitrogen, called fixed nitrogen, in order to live. We humans then obtain our fixed nitrogen by eating plants or by eating other animals that have obtained it from eating plants. As we discussed in our last chapter, to which I'll link here, in nature, fixed nitrogen is obtained from bacteria that live in the roots of certain plants and make it from N2 in the air. Fixed nitrogen can also be obtained from saltpeter, which is commonly called nitre, which is found in large quantities in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So this takes us to an interesting story. In the early 1900s, Germany had a problem. At that time, most of the world's agricultural fertilizers were obtained from nitre deposits in Chile, which was an American ally. Now, as you can imagine, Germans wanted to come up with a way of getting fixed nitrogen from a more German-friendly source. In time, a man named Fritz Haber devised a means of accomplishing this. This means centered on the following reaction right here, as well as Haber's knowledge of Le Chatelier's principle. So let me explain this reaction. As it turns out, if you have nitrogen gas, N2, which is a useless form of nitrogen, and hydrogen gas in a closed vessel, they will eventually reach a state of equilibrium in which they form this 
form of nitrogen, NH3 ammonia, which is a useful form of nitrogen, or fixed nitrogen. The problem with this equilibrium reaction is that it strongly and heavily favors the left side, the reactant side. So once it reaches equilibrium, there's only a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of this uh, NH3 and a huge amount of reactant. Now, Haber understood Le Chatelier's principle. He knew, as should you now, that if it were somehow possible to reach in and remove NH3, then what would occur is the equilibrium reaction would then fill in that hole by producing more NH3. Now, if you could reach in with a magic hand and remove more NH3, then, of course, the reactants over here would shift further to produce more NH3. And if you could do that again and again and again and again, then in essence, you could make this reaction become as if it were a completely one-way reaction of reactants converting totally to product, and you could get a lot of NH3, fixed nitrogen, which is useful for plants and animals. Now, of course, Haber did not possess a magic hand that had the ability to remove NH3, but he did possess his knowledge of physics and of Le Chatelier's principle. He invented this, called a Haber device, which did basically the following. It had a chamber that had N2 and H2 gas in it. That chamber was kept warm so that eventually an equilibrium was established. That chamber was then connected to another chamber that was cooled to probably less than negative 78 degrees Celsius, so a very cold temperature. At that low cold temperature, NH3 turns into a liquid. You can then open up a valve and drain that liquid off and then close the valve, which allows the N2 and H2 to continue circulating between the two chambers. Because you've now removed product on the right side of the equation, the equilibrium reaction reestablishes or restores balance by forming more NH3. That NH3 eventually shifts over to the cold chamber where it's cooled and converts back to a liquid and can be drained off. If you do this again and again and again, you can, in essence, get this reaction to convert almost to 100% efficiency by converting these reactants almost 100% over to NH3, which is a useful fixed form of nitrogen. Why do we care about this so much? Because this process, when it was discovered by Haber in the early 1900s, was used to develop commercial fertilizers which contain fixed forms of nitrogen that are useful for plants. N2 isn't useful for plants, but NH3 is. This allowed Germans to be able to obtain fertilizer from sources other than Chile. That process is still used today. In fact, it's estimated that about 50% of all nitrogen atoms in every single human being on Earth today originated from fixed nitrogen that was formed using the Haber process on an industrial scale. Once again, all of this fixed nitrogen is formed using the Haber process and then embedded in fertilizers which are then used as plant food. Plants take that fixed nitrogen and use them to grow, form fruits and other things that we eat or that other animals that we eat eat, and then we in turn later consume those and we obtain those nitrogen atoms embedded within us. Isn't that exciting? I think it is, and it's totally something that has affected every single one of us. Beyond this, this invention also allowed farmers to increase food productivity significantly across the earth. Interestingly, Fritz Haber, who was awarded the Nobel Prize for this discovery, also became the uh, father of modern chemical warfare. And all of the chemical warfare agents used by Germany during World War I were invented mostly by him. Hence, he is sometimes called the father of life for having invented this means of obtaining fixed nitrogen for fertilizers, greatly increasing the productivity of agriculture across the world, and the father of death for inventing chemical warfare which is one of the cruelest and most horrible types of warfare that exists. That takes us to the end of this lecture and the end of this chapter on chemical equilibrium. Please stay tuned to the next chapter, which I will teach you something more about chemistry. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.